This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. On this show, we invite app industry professionals to cover various topics. We promise to do our best to keep it both insightful but brief. In this episode, we have George Sharpe, founder of Favorite. George, welcome to the Business of Apps podcast. Hi, how's it going? I'm doing great. So, listen, in previous episodes, we talked about app marketing from several angles. We talked about app data, ways to promote apps via free paid channels. It's time to take a holistic view at what app marketing is as a whole and guide you through the components of so-called full marketing funnel. And this is why we have George with us today. But as always, before doing all that, let's start with something different. Uh, George, please tell us about yourself, your background. Yeah, absolutely. So I myself have been in marketing for just over 10 years now. I always sort of worked in, in the corporate space. So I, I started my career actually in the music industry. So I worked for a, a music ma- management company, looking after artists like LaRue and the Claxons and Richard Ashcroft. Mm-hmm. After that, I went to uh, Live Nation and Ticketmaster. So still in the music industry, working on the live music side. And uh, after a couple of years there, I moved on to Universal Music, mm-hmm. where I spent some time working with their tier one artists. So artists like Lady Gaga, Sam Smith, Taylor mm-hmm. Swift, and that, 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 the likes of those types of artists. And then, you know, I felt by that point, I was like, oh, I've been in the music industry for so long now. I've had enough. I want to leave the music industry. I have to get out. And then, yeah, an opportunity at Apple arose. So I decided to go for it. And, uh, yeah, it was for a role to to basically look after all of the marketing internationally for App Store, We're working with other apps. And I thought, you know what? Apps are cool. I love tech. I love Apple. Uh-huh. It's a great opportunity. So I decided to go for it. And, yeah, I, I managed to get the job there after about 12 interviews. It was pretty intense. And I was like, you know what? Success. I managed to get out of the music industry. Brilliant. Yeah, really happy about that. And then after about six months, they're like, hey, George, we're, we're um, releasing this new, uh, you know, this, this new product called Apple Music would love for you to to own this as well obviously because of your background i was like oh god yeah. back in the music industry so it's one of those things you know what, what once you're in the music industry it's very hard to leave anyway i spent about three years looking after all of the marketing for app store and apple music as well as the launch of iphone 6 7 and the first apple watch and yeah pretty much spent most of my time doing app marketing and really going into the sort of the depths of what true app marketing means and you know it's really going beyond the app install and i think that that's pretty much what we want to talk about today do you miss your time in apple or in music business or both i enjoyed the music industry you know i had a cool job at universal uh, which i sort of miss because i was basically the lead for innovation and most of the innovation was you know at the time was going mm-hmm. around and telling people to use Facebook. That was the innovation, you know, because, you know, in, in those days, it was very much like, you know, it was, it was press, it was print, it was radio, it was blah, blah, blah. I said, hey, you know, there's this new tool that everyone's using called Facebook and Instagram, you know, we might want to check it out. You know, so it's, it's a bit being, you know, one of the first people to actually get artists like Taylor Swift or Lady Gaga or whatever to, to actually adopt these platforms and actually use them as marketing channels was, was quite fun. Do I miss it compared to what I'm doing now? No, I, I absolutely love working with the companies that we work with. I mean, w- one of the main reasons I wanted to to leave the corporate side was to, to actually work with startups. I'd never worked with startups before. I really loved watching the TV show Silicon Valley. And... I don't know, I just got really into it. So, you know, ever since setting up the agency, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with a whole variety of startups. You know, some have have been just, you know, one man bands with a really nice idea and a bit of cash all the way through to companies that have, you know, raised Series A, Series B and, you know, sort of going for the, the big stuff. So it's been an absolute pleasure to work with them and sort of see these companies grow, which, you know, you, you don't really get that, that sort of view when, when you're working with very big companies. 
I see. Awesome. So let's get to the topic of our today's conversation and let's start with the basics. So what is the full funnel marketing? So full funnel marketing to me means marketing beyond the app install. So when I first left Apple and I start, started work with a handful of app marketing, uh, sorry, app companies, and you know all they cared about was you know how many installs did I get and how much was the cost per install. Exactly. And it took took a lot of time for me to sort of educate them and say, you know, I don't even care how much the cost per install is. I don't care. You know, for me, it's about how much does it costs to have a converted user or have a paying user or have a full registered user. You know, whatever it may be that you're using as your main metric to convince investors to give you more cash. And nowadays, I can tell you, it's app installs, you know, something that gets investors excited anymore. You know, so you really need to look beyond the app install. To me, an app install is the equivalent of a website visit. That's all it is. You know, mm -hmm. they've taken the time to press, you know, get and they download on their phone. You know, you know, some, some stats that we, we, we that, you know, I, I used to work off was, you know, two out of three people who downloaded an app didn't even open the thing, you know. So it, it, it's a massive challenge to then try and, you know, retune the mindset of app founders or, app, you know, head of marketing or whatever to, to say, Yes, an app install is all well and good. And yes, uh, cost per app install is important in the grand scheme of things. However, you know, we, we actually look at one metric before the app install cost, which is what we call the, the click to install rate. So that tells me it's, it's a measurement of me being able to say, you know, this is how many clicks we got and this is how many installs we got. Okay, now I know which campaigns that we can scale before I even know which ones have driven the most installs yet. You know, it's like a pre-metric, basically. That leads on to the, the fact of saying, well, what happens after the install? Do they complete registration? Do they get stuck at a certain point within the registration? How, how am I going to get more people through that registration? And one sort of metric that I always share tends to get app founders or app marketing managers more interested is me saying, would you rather I increase your conversion rate by 1% or, or do you want me to, to completely double your budget to get the same number of users? And it, that's, that's literally it. You know, so we work in, in like, as I said, beyond the app install, it's the full funnel. So that includes acquisition right at the top. So that's all your advertising, influence marketing, affiliate marketing, whatever it may be. But then also your mid and lower funnel. So that's your email marketing, your push notifications, your in-app market, in-app notifications, your SMS, and, and, and you know, to some extent, sometimes remarketing um, via advertising. We also work on that as well. So what we do is we develop a system that we call milestones. And then, mm -hmm. then basically looking to increase the conversion rate for each milestone to the next. Because, yes, you have your ultimate conversion rate, which is app install all the way through to, let's say, a subscriber or a paying customer or whatever, whatever, it, you know, whatever it might be. But what we do is we dissect, you know, that, that's a very long journey between those two. What we do is we dissect that into the milestones. If there's 12 milestones, I know that if I can increase milestone one to 11 by one percent but ultimately milestone one to 12 is going to increase you know but if if you just try to increase milestone one to 12 without even looking at two to 11 it's gonna be very hard and and it's, it's simply because you don't have that insight as to what actually people are doing in your app the number of times i've spoken to app founders you know who they know more about their app than anyone and i've said to them how many people come back to your app after 28 days and they literally have no idea. They just Amazing. don't know. And it's just, it's, you know, this is what investors are looking for nowadays. Investors have got savvy, you know, cause they, they invested millions and millions of pounds into apps that had millions of downloads, but then realized they had no customers. So they, they've got a lot savvier now and they, they're looking for the core metrics that any app company reports on now, which is you know, it, it's monthly active users, weekly active users, daily active users, it's retention, it's churn, it's, you know, uh, growth in, in terms of 
customer acquisition. And like by, by acquisition, I mean customers, not app installs. You know, so we need to make sure that we, you know, implement the infrastructure that enables us to do this for app companies properly. Exactly. So infrastructure t- typically comes as, as being, you know, an app attribution tool and an in-app marketing tool and an analytics tool. You know, there are some tools that try to do all three. There are some that maybe do one or two, but that, that tends to be the first hurdle for us when working with sort of newer app-based companies because right. they think that they can just have Google Firebase because that's what the developer recommends. And I say, well, I'm not a developer. I'm a marketing manager. You know, we, we, we need something different. You know, we need something a bit more robust, you know? So yeah, that, that's what full funnel marketing is. It's really taking a step back, looking at the entire picture of the user journey from app install to customer. And there's, unfortunately, there's, there's too many agencies that only focus on the app install piece and, you know, get getting as many app installs as possible for the cheapest cost possible. But, you know, I've, I've seen it too many times now where having tons of app installs at 20p is useless at the end of the day. You know, if they don't even open your app, it's just, it's, it's not even, I wouldn't even consider it an app install. You know, you have a first-hand experience of, um, you know, being in close contact with the app startups. And uh, it's kind of amazing for me because I, when you're, you know, reading a lot about the importance of, you know, uh, what people do after they install and you have a perception like this should be common knowledge for everybody. Like if you read about this thing over and over, it should be like, you know, the uh, standard practice for app app developer out there. But the fact that you still see people are basically confusing um, what there should be, their, mass prior- their major priorities should be how they should focus their attention to and what's happening after people got an app and what they're doing inside and how it influenced their revenue generation model. So it's amazing. So it just goes to reinforce the necessity to <laughs> conduct an interview like this to let people know that they're mistaking, that they're you know, putting all eggs into the one basket. Okay, got as much uh, downloads I, I can get and that's, that's my recipe for the happiness. But let's walk through the funnel, starting from the very broad upper part, from the awareness, interest. What app marketers should know about app advertising today, and what's working for this first, uh, the upper part of the funnel? First, you need to look at you know what type of app you are and like what you're looking for, and ultimately how are you going to make money from these users? You know, a game is very different to a utility, so. What we like to do is we like to run performance marketing campaigns where we actually test a variety of different channels and then we optimize the creative, the content, the call to action, the audiences within the channels. And then we start to optimize between those channels to, to split the budgets to drive the ultimate, not, not just app users, but, but, but quality users, the ones that we know convert the most. So mm-hmm. I'd say a t- typical marketing mix, if you have a... A smaller budget, let's say you've got £5,000 a month or less, then you are going to be looking at channels like Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, and Google UAC, um, mm-hmm. which is the universal app campaigns. You know, five channels and a £5,000 budget for a month. You know, you're already sort of splitting yourself pretty thin. So you, I don't think you'd want to go very much more than that. If you've got more budget to spend, then then we start to look beyond the, the sort of duopoly, they call it, and mm-hmm. and start to look at, you know, sort of in-app networks and and see where we can maybe get some some inventory across, you know, spaces within other apps. And if you're a game, then it gets very, very complicated complex because you know there's very very advanced in-app networks and solutions that enable you to run very very complicated and, and unique ad formats that you know i think most utility apps don't ever really understand you know but you know i've, I've got a little four-year-old boy he loves playing on the ipad and you know every day i find a new game on there because there was some game he was playing and then there was an ad where he would have to play some of the game in order to continue and then had the option to download. Um, those types of formats, you know, that you're, you, you're very much looking at, I'd say, advanced type of ad setups. But, you know, if, if you've got 5,000 to 50,000 pounds, you're, you're going to be happy 
with Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, and Google, to be honest. As speaking of um, duopoly, uh, which you, you mentioned, and you mentioned TikTok as well, do you see TikTok as the challenger of the duopoly? What are your thoughts on its potential? Yeah, so I mean, we were one of the first agencies in the UK to actually run app advertising on TikTok. And I have to say, you know, from a logistical framework, it's an absolute nightmare. It really is. I mean, they're so new. It, it's like, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I never did Facebook ads when Facebook ads first came out, but I, I can imagine mm -hmm. that it was a real pain. So TikTok is a great channel to reach a certain type of audience at very cheap cost. To put that into context, if you're looking to reach people who are 13 to 21, 13 to 23, something like that, and you want to get as much awareness as possible, TikTok is great. There's not many advertisers on there at the moment. The beta platform, although it's very clunky, it doesn't enable you to reach the type of audiences that you're looking for at a very cheap cost. You know, So we typically are paying about... A 50p, so 50 UK p CPM, mm -hmm. you know, compared to on Instagram where we're paying five pounds. So it's 10 times cheaper to reach the, you know, a similar audience on TikTok than it is on Instagram. The challenge is, I don't know if you've ever used TikTok, no. but to get these people away from TikTok and doing something else is a real challenge because it's in a very, it's a very addictive app. So for us, it's worked really, really well for lifestyle, you know, very laid back type apps. Mm -hmm. When we've tried to do, you know, more advanced, more complicated type stuff, um, it hasn't worked well at all. You know, so if you're an investment app or a fintech or something like that, just don't don't bother with TikTok at the moment. Not until they at least can try and get some more de data to optimize your campaigns better. However, if you're a lifestyle app, let's say, I mean, we work with a bunch of fashion apps. We work with a bunch of sports apps. It works really well. It works well based on the fact that it's just so cheap to reach these people. You know, 50 cents to reach a thousand people versus five pounds. You know, I can reach 10 times the audience. So mm -hmm. just based on the fact that it's very, very cheap to run the ads means that we're able to, to drive very, very favorable app install costs do they do those app installs convert as well as on instagram no in my in my sort of experience so far no, no they don't um is that something to do maybe with the audience that they're just younger and maybe they're not as committed maybe i don't know however based on the volume it, it works out roughly about the same as what we see on instagram so you'll get a lot more installs you'll get the same number of conversions at the same cost all right, I see. Let's get back to the funnel. So basically, I'm going to provide the like a general graphic that describes the funnel in the this episode, the notes for people to check out. But now I'm just going to tell them that the whole funnel, we can basically divide into three parts, which start with awareness and interest. Then there's a part where it's a consideration when people are checking options, they're, they're checking the apps that they see in the app store. And then are doing pretty much the same thing, but they're trying to make up their mind. Okay, which one works for me best? They're checking the reviews, probably some YouTube videos, like trying to get a perspective. Okay, which one of these like five, 10 is the one I'm going to use, right? So moving kind of down the funnel, what app marketers should do once they've got a potential app user's initial interest, but they not need to persuade them to go down to actually do what they're expecting them to buy something inside an app to do an action. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, this is where the attribution is so important. Actually knowing exactly what people are doing within your app and why they're potentially not doing something that you're expecting them to do or why, you know, a certain cohort of users are doing more of something than what you're expecting. So by having an attribution tool, you know, adjust or, apps flyer or branch whatever it may be enables you to, to first un understand your app funnel second understand what people are actually doing within your app and then three is, is really to be able to map out i guess a strategy to try and hold people's hands through your funnel and what i mean by hold their hand is that you know apps can be quite complicated just like websites and 
to just let someone just have free reign and just do whatever they want on your website, they, they get lost, they get distracted, they they jump off, they you know you know a fake Facebook notification comes through or whatever it may be, right? And they, they and, and mm-hmm. they're gone. So we want to be able to essentially show them how to go through your app. And we learn that by having the right tools in place and then being able to identify the best user journey to, that leads to the goal that we're intending. Whether that be the ultimate goal of, you know, from my earlier example, milestone one to milestone 12, or just from milestone four to milestone five, you know, each of those needs to be looked at intrinsically. And ju- just to give you an example of that is, you know, we worked with a we still do. We work with an investment app. And step 14 of their onboarding journey is to, to ask for the user's national insurance number. And I can tell you, no one knows their national insurance number. I know mine, but I'm, I'm a widow. Like, but no, no one else knows their national insurance number off by heart. And you know, I said to them from the beginning, I said, look, people are going to drop off here. You're going to lose people because no one knows this. Like, what are they going to do? Go home and start like ruffling through their, their P60s and their, their tax documents to try and find this number because they're absolutely desperate to sign up to your platform right now. It's not going to happen. So we, we I- I implemented the tech. We mapped out the milestones and we mapped out that funnel. And the funnel literally is, you know, 100% app install. Then it was 92% people got through past the email. And then 91% got to this point, blah, blah, blah. All, all the way to, you know, the um, the 14th step, which was to add your your national insurance number. And it was at that point that 70% of people dropped off. Amazing. So we knew that, okay, between 13 and 14 of our milestones, we need to develop a marketing campaign to get to make sure people you know either come back or whatever so it actually worked on two sides so the first side was the product side we need to be able to let people fully register their account without having to input their national insurance number and we have to have them basically input their national insurance number in there later that was the first thing that we did so product level the second was the actual marketing strategy between milestone 13 and 14 what are we actually going to communicate to users and how are we going to communicate to them to to make sure that that 70 percent drop off we we can at least capture let's say 20 or 30 or 40 percent of those people to complete that registration so this is what i mean by by having a, a marketing strategy for every milestone within your funnel, not not just oh, you know, our strategy is to get app installs and then convert them to users. That's a very broad strategy. I I need a marketing strategy for every stage between each of your milestones. Each of them has their own strategy, and the reason for that is because it's very complicated to get people through a funnel on an app. Um, so so when it comes to to the, the in-app side and, and that, that mid, mid-funnel part, you know, I really, really want to make sure that people have to understand that I, I want to dissect your entire app and map out those milestones and then develop a strategy on getting people from milestone one to two, from two to three, from three to four, from four to five, not just one to 12, you know? So, so that that's really what it means when we talk about, you know, the sort of, the, the full funnel and, and developing the marketing for that full funnel. The reason why we had to develop a, a strategy between every milestone is because I want to implement that same level of performance marketing, or you know, some people call it growth hacking, you know, mm-hmm. but for every for every step within your within your funnel. I want to I want to go that granular between every stage of that funnel because you never know, we might test something and find something that works better. So we, we want to continue testing between every stage of your funnel as well. And that's that, that's sort of where that whole concept comes from. All right. Now, just going to the third part, the purchase part of the full marketing funnel, there are basically three ways how, actually four, how people make money in apps. You see they're in a purchase, when somebody is purchasing some additional functional in your app, it's a subscription model and people subscribe for your app plus uh, the content it provides for a certain period or kind of a small sliver of like the whole ecosystem of apps, actually paid apps. Um, Somebody is paying for a copy of your app in advance and you're not getting any, get any money from that person. And there's obviously advertising. So from an app 
revenue generation perspective, what kind of effective ways to get people to this final portion of the funnel you can uh, suggest? Yeah, again, so this is where we'd like to have that growth hacking mindset because I think a lot a lot of apps, they sort of maybe have just one business model and they just try and churn that business model like to the ground. And really, for me, it's about why don't we test five and see which one has the best pickup? You know, so we worked with a fitness app, for example, where they had a one-month subscription, a three-month subscription, six-month and 12 months. And what we were starting to do there was to actually start testing the price on each of those models, but pulling out a certain cohort. So we only tested that price on a certain amount of people. So then, then you know, rather than just having that, that you know, here's, here, are the, here are the four prices, so be it. And ultimately, potentially, actually affecting your overall conversion rate in the long run, we would pull out certain cohorts of users and test pricing. And that really helped us uh, to understand which pricing worked, you know, on different types of users. So mm -hmm. for us, you know, I, I think, you know, having that sort of testing mindset is even important right at that last step. So don't just sort of say, right, we're going to put all of our eggs in one basket and we are a one-time, you know, payment app. That's it. No, no. I would really ask you to test the subscription model. Or I'd really ask you to test a sort of freemium model, you know? So mm -hmm. there's many ways to approach, you know, how you get money from customers. But I really think that companies should, should test more and make sure you understand that there are different types of people that would, are willing to part with their cash in different types of ways. You know, I absolutely hate paying to receive a bit of something and then having to pay again, you know, the freemium model for me, just as, as a, as a person, I just don't agree with it, but for some, some people, they love it. They love those micro transactions. You can attain money from people in that way. I'm more of a subscription person myself. That's just the way I work. I subscribe to something. If I keep using it, I'll keep paying. If I don't, I'll unsubscribe. And there's a whole percentage of users that do it that way. And then there's a certain percentage of users that just want to pay for something once, you know, and like forget about it. So, you know, I think that there's, that there's an argument to say that all of those models should be tested to some extent before you just sort of go all guns blazing into one and just, just hope that it works and wish for the best. So when we do that full funnel marketing, we like to make sure that at that last step, we actually test you know, a variety of payment methods and payment types to different types of users and ultimately see which one will get the best re return on investment, the best result, the highest percentage of conversions, but also the, 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 the best CAC. So just, you know, the, in terms of the cost it takes to get that, that person to become a customer. So, but then you also have to layer that with churn and, and everything else. But eventually after doing, let's say three to six months of testing, you, you can, you know, sort of hand on heart say, this is the best overall model to go wide with, go very wide with. And m meaning that, you know, ideally you would get the, you know, the best return on investment. All right, gotcha. So we've got a full picture of what is full marketing funnel now. Three major parts and tips and tricks for every part of this trio. Uh, now, this is the part of the show when I'm asking a few funny quick questions. Uh, are you iOS or Android person? iOS. Yeah, that was an easy part. <laughs> I would guess <laughs> it for sure. Yeah, kind of a... Before <laughs> Apple, I, I was actually a, I was an Android I was always a Samsung. I, I think I had a HTC before that. So HTC, Samsung, and then uh, yeah, I moved to Apple. Obviously, when starting Apple, I think I think if I did didn't, I probably wouldn't have a job at Apple. I actually my my first Apple phone. I actually uh, won a competition at an event. Uh -huh. uh, there was like this little game you had to play, and the person with the high score won an Apple phone. And I spent the whole day at the exhibition just playing this game. I didn't see anyone. I didn't learn anything. I just, I just played this game all day and I got the highest score and I won this phone and it was, oh, what's his face? Who was that guy from Baywatch? He was the guy that gave me the phone. Oh, really? What's his name? Like, dude, 
Baywatch. He, he was in Baywatch. Maybe. He's like quite oh quite a famous actor. The the original one. Oh, I think I know what what, what the actor old the mean. old Baywatch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Da- David Hasselhoff. See. Oh yeah, right, exactly. Right. David Hasselhoff was the guy that presented me with my first ever iPhone, and then, but then I sold it because I was obviously Android at the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So, uh, do you remember your first mobile phone? I'm talking about the dumb phone yeah. before the smartphone. I had a Nokia 3310. Do you remember that phone? <laughs> Yeah, and to be honest, like every guest on the show, like like a seventy percent or so, are naming this phone as the first phone they had. I do remember that one. Um, I think it was I've the using first it. phone where you could do like like you can make your own ringtones. It was brilliant. I loved it. Yeah, for back in the day, it was a really cool device. But what about your favorite app now, and why? I'm going to look through my apps and just see if there's one that I use a lot that I love. I use, at the moment, I'm using TikTok a lot, as you do. I play a lot of Pokemon Go with my son because he still. loves it. Uh, yeah, I know. You know, it's still going strong. And, you know, there's still a lot, a lot of plays. A big shout out to an app called Wombat which is a investment app that I use it's a it's an amazing app it helps people get into investing in the first you know in, in the first instance um and if anyone is going to invest now is the time buy when stocks are low i would never guess the purpose of the app i would, I would think it's something about biology education or something <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and yeah i mean i use uh i use a couple of apps i i use reddit a lot i i think i'm i'm actually a, a very generic app user if that makes sense you know i use the classic mm-hmm. apps but yeah i mean i'd say those those are the, the ones i want to give a shout out to did you think about any technologies that you're most excited about what are you expecting from apps in the coming years uh what are you waiting for i think for me it's really about the complexity that the yeah, apps is still very it lives in developer land you know And mm-hmm. unless you have like, you know, this team of very smart people who can build and it's very hard for for people to to sort of enter this space. And yeah, yes, there are some smart people that are savvy people who, you know, they find offshore teams or whatever it may be. But you know building apps is is nowhere near as close as what building your own web website is, you know. So yeah. I think for me, it, it'll be a huge turning point when you have the Squarespace for apps or a Wix for apps, you know, mm-hmm. that sort of drag and drop. Any any old person could come in, learn it in 20 minutes, and they have an idea and they release the app store. You know, right right now is very much, you know, yeah, you need to have that tech expertise. You need to know about SDKs. You need a developer. You probably need a product manager. You know, it's very, very hard for people to get into this space. And that's what's holding this whole industry back, is that it's just the entry point into actually getting this done. You know, you need to be entrepreneurial. And once that's solved, one day it will be. Yeah, I think that there'll be an explosion of, of apps and ideas and, and opportunities that, that will completely change the way that, that we consume apps and that change the way we actually live our lives, hopefully. One we hope we'll see. Uh, now, before I let you go, I hope people can get to, to know more what you do. So I guess the best place to go is, is our website, uh, which is favored.co.uk. So it's F-A-V-O-U-R-E-D, favored.co.uk. Um, yeah, check out the website. We've got lots of information on there. Um, and yeah. That's great. Thanks a lot for your time, George. Thank you. That's Thanks brilliant. for coming Thanks on so the podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye. And that was George Sharper, founder of Favorite. To listen to more episodes, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Just search for Business of Apps and you will find us easily. Once you subscribe, you will be able to get new episodes on your smartphone, tablet, or computer as soon as we release them. And please don't forget to leave us a review and comment. It is highly appreciated. And don't forget that all episodes will also be available on businessofapps.com. Till the next time. Bye. This is the Business of Apps podcast, bringing you actionable insights from the leaders of the global app industry and the world's fastest growing apps. You can find more app news, data and analysis over at businessofapps.com. Thank you for listening to the Business of Apps podcast. For more, head on over to businessofapps.com.